I was talking to one of the paediatric trainees that I work with and I asked her, what is she afraid of? <coughs> and she said it was talking to adolescents about drugs and alcohol. She said that no matter how hard she tries, how many affirmations she uses, she changes the tone of her voice. It's a sort of low, naughty voice like your grandmother might hear, or the teachers going listening. She's not 100% sure why she does it, but she thinks it's in part being uncomfortable with the issue and unfamiliar, and also not knowing what to do with the answer. I'd like to tell you a story about a woman I met a number of years ago in the emergency department, and she taught me something that I was afraid of, about myself. It was a busy Saturday evening shift in the emergency department when I met Abby. I should say, heard her screaming and yelling abuse at paramedics and nurses. I was just about to reduce a teenager's dislocated shoulder when the commotion interrupted me. Abby had been found at a train station unconscious, covered with dirt and urine and vomit. Was she injured? Had she been sexually assaulted? She was well known to paramedics as a frequent flyer with alcohol intoxication. And despite a blood alcohol level that would render most of us in the room unconscious, she had awoken on arrival in the emergency department. The commotion disturbed Gwen, and while I was assessing Abby, Gwen came storming in, walking stick raised. All she needs is a good whack! <laughs> a part of me, a Mr Hyde part of me, agreed with Gwen. <laughs> Why was my work in the emergency department constantly interrupted with people with intoxication, self-inflicted? Gwen was taken away and calmed down. Abby, code grey, restraints, physical, chemical, stand down, me back to the child with a dislocated shoulder. Over the course of the evening, I heard repeated calls from Abby. Help me. I need help. Increasingly frustrated and desperate, at the end of my shift, I reviewed her, and I was stunned to find out that at 23, she was already hopelessly dependent on alcohol. Multiple failed detox. She had signs of alcoholic liver disease, lost family, friends, and work. She cried as she told me that only two years earlier, she'd been in her final year of teacher training college, and now her life was a mess. I cried with her, thinking, how can I help this woman? Alcohol and drug dependency is so frustrating for a clinician who just wants to fix things, just wants to relocate that shoulder. But it turned out that I could have helped Abby. But that was five years earlier. Something seemed familiar about her, and a review of the electronic medical record had determined that I'd seen Abby five years earlier. It was University O Week, and she'd decided to go running around the campus barefoot. She cut her foot. Like many alcohol-related injuries, it went unnoticed till the next day. She arrived in the ED, polite, embarrassed, hungover. Tet talks, washout, suture, dressing. I now believe I missed an opportunity to intervene on the 18-year-old Abby's life. Not only that, I likely gave the behaviour a cultural nod of approval, a rite of passage for the young university student.
So what can we do about these issues? Well, when I have a difficult problem, a conundrum, I turn to the doctor who I feel has done more to help <laughs> children internationally than any other doctor. By addressing a social determinant of health, of literacy, he's impacted on more lives. It's Dr. Zeus, of course. What was I scared of is a story of a pair of spooky, pale green pants <laughs> with no body inside them. The narrator of the story comes across the pants in spooky and dark places and despite knowing they shouldn't be afraid, is petrified. It leads them to hide in a brickle bush in a dark and lonely schneid field about nine miles wide. Just like my paediatric trainee, the narrator uses an affirmation to try and convince herself she's not scared. She says, I am not scared of those green pants with nobody inside them. She said those words, she said them, she said them, but she lied them. It was, in fact, by getting to know the pants and getting to understand the problems that she was able to overcome her fears. So how do we overcome the fears and how do we understand adolescents with drug and alcohol problems when, when we look for research, it is sadly lacking? Most ED-based research is retrospective, single-site, coding-based, or using attributable fractions, and largely underestimates the size of the problem, I believe. And in fact, um, despite that fact, um, over the last decade, the problem appears to be increasing. We studied uh, alcohol harm in eight mixed emergency departments around Australia and New Zealand for a week period, and we screened over 8,000 patients. We found uh, that about 9.5% of presentations over a week period were there as a result of alcohol harm. That's almost one in 10. We had about um, 300 adolescents in our study, and the rate in adolescents was about 6%. And what is concerning is that while you can see uh, that adolescents actually only contribute a small amount to alcohol harm, when people turn 18, uh, that contribution increases dramatically. What do we know about uh, drug and alcohol use on a national scale? Just a few weeks ago, the National Drug Survey was released, and this is probably our best data. Uh, the survey is done every two to three years. And what we've seen is a pleasing, continued downtrend in drug and alcohol use in young people. But I don't believe this is any reason for complacency, especially since we seem to be seeing more harm in the emergency department. But also, um, the recent results still equates to one in five adolescents having consumed alcohol in the last year. And as you can see here, there's a drown trend in adolescents and young people that have consumed four or standard drinks, at least monthly. But that's still one in 20 adolescents that are consuming four standard drinks monthly. The drown trends are less so in the young people. But of interest to all the parents in the audience, uh, actually the parents of these kids are drinking more. <laughs> <laughs> as are uh, the population that's producing our next paediatric uh, patients. And this is concerning because there will be a trickle-down effect. Once again, if you look at binge drinking, 11 drinks, more, drinking more than 11 drinks, these are the people that end up in the emergency department, has trended down in adolescence. But there is a huge jump uh, once you get to 18. With the known toxic effect of alcohol on the developing brain, this has called for public health uh, advocates to call for uh, a change to the uh, drinking age. And this is a public health intervention uh, that I believe paediatricians and emergency physicians should be joining with them uh, to advocate for this thing. Other highlights for you from the National Drug Survey is adolescents are largely turning away um, from tobacco, with only 2% uh, 
uh, having smoked in the last year. Unfortunately, there's a little less keen to turn away from cannabis, with that being the absolute illicit drug of choice for young people, with one in seven adolescents having consumed, consumed it in the last year. What about ice? Well, we know that there's a lot uh, of media concern around that, and there has been a major public health intervention by the government. Uh, and we know it's probably in adolescents, about one in a hundred will have consumed methamphetamines. That low prevalence, of course, uh, has to be balanced by the high uh, impact, especially in regional areas and indigenous populations. And that's just a graph showing you the downtrends. Uh, unfortunately, 2016 is a peach colour that virtually doesn't appear on any of these government graphs. But you can see uh, that the illicit drug use is very small. So what has contributed um, to these reductions? Has it been culture change? We know uh, that Australia has a very strong culture in relation to alcohol, and in recent years, um, our restrictions around advertising of alcohol uh, to children have actually been made more laxed by the government and the regulators. So children are now exposed to more sponsorship uh, and advertising in sport than ever before. So it's unlikely that there's been any impact on our innate culture, uh, but it has been argued that with the immigration, particularly from uh, Middle East and Asia, uh, that's had a diluted effect and been partially responsible for the reduction that we've seen. What about education? Do we have Harold from Life Education to thank for it? Well, unfortunately, the, education, the evidence for edu education impacting in a population level is weak at best. And we know that Harold has recently had ice added to his toolkit, uh, which is concerning uh, because international evidence would suggest that when you have very low prevalence drugs, one in a hundred, uh, that providing education, mass education campaigns may actually paradoxically increase use. Supply or reducing access to alcohol is a key public health lever for reducing harm. We've seen in Sydney, we've seen in Newcastle, in Brisbane, a dramatic reduction in the most serious assaults and injuries which often target young people. Uh, with fairly modest reductions in access to alcohol. In Australia, in most jurisdictions over the last decade, um, most jurisdictions have enacted the secondary supply of alcohol laws. That makes it illegal for anyone to supply alcohol to any person under 18 without the express consent of their parent. In some jurisdictions, that needs to be written. They're accompanied by um, the idea of responsible serving in many jurisdictions, which mean that the adult must be sober and, and must not serve uh, the adolescent uh, in, in excess. Many, many, most jurisdictions, um, apart from um, South Australia, have fairly hefty fines, and it can be per teenager, so a party like this one could end up very, very expensive for someone. But in Tasmania, you can be put in prison for supplying alcohol to young people. We know, uh, I believe, that this is likely to have had a big impact. And just in the way as clinicians have advocated for our drink driving laws, I believe this is another key area that every clinician that sees adolescents and young people can intervene in. If we witness these laws to be broken, we should be informing uh, parents about their responsibilities. What about brief intervention? We know that the WHO recommends brief intervention as a key international lever for reducing alcohol harm. But only, they estimate, about 5% of the people that are eligible to get one uh, get a brief intervention. While emergency clinicians are broadly accepting and support public health interventions in the emergency department, our study of over 800 clinicians 
demonstrated that there were severe barriers, specifically around time and resources. And this quote from the um, survey eloquently describes that paradox. Just bailing ship. So we don't really have time to do them, but do they work? Now, there are numerous studies, meta-analysis, systematic reviews. Many of these brief interventions take anywhere from half an hour to an hour. They require dedicated staff. A public health clinician's idea of brief is clearly uh, not an emergency clinician's or busy paediatrician's. Uh, and there are major methodological issues with assessing whether they work, particularly heterogeneity around the outcome measures, which can be uh, just reduction in drinking or reduction in violence. Many of the control groups also um, involve screening, involve a pamphlet, uh, and involve payment to young people, so they're not a true... Uh, uh, measure of control group, uh, and they may dilute any effect size. But despite that, there is a clear signal of benefit with a Cohen's effect size of around 0.2 to 0.3 uh, for brief interventions. And particularly in adolescents, uh, that's likely to be greater. Just as a warning, um, don't search for an image of ultra brief on the internet <laughs> on your work computer because you may end up in trouble with the, the responsible use of the internet. Um, so I had to keep this one covered up. Um, but armed with our information from the clinicians, uh, we wanted to look at what about ultra brief interventions. So they had to take less than 10 minutes, which is less time um, than I have for my lunch break, um, and um, or be insisted by a computer um, so they could a DIY intervention. And once again, we found this clear signal for benefit. Um, of our intervention, the only uh, systematic review, the only paper that specifically targeted adolescents was this one by Rebecca Cunningham uh, and others from Michigan in the US. And she's done a lot of the groundbreaking research uh, in this area. And um, they screened over 3,000 adolescents in their study looking for alcohol harm plus violence. And shockingly, 25% of their, adult, their adolescents screened positive for alcohol and violence. Their group were randomised um, to a control group or intervention by a therapist, which took half an hour, or intervention um, via computer. Um, and um, they found that at, at three and 12 months, no change in the amount of drinking, uh, but uh, a reduction in alcohol-related violence, with a number needed to treat of about eight adolescents to reduce one very serious violent event. Unfortunately, at the 12-month review, um, it was only the therapist group that the benefit was still seen in. Another study, uh, which was ED-based and targeting young people aged 18 to 24, used tailored and um, targeted text messages. And this showed a significant reduction in, in binge drinking. There is a plethora of research occurring around novel ways of, um, of brief interventions, particularly in young people. And unfortunately, a lot of the research is almost outdated before it's published um, with the rapid changes in social media. Uh, but I feel that it is going to be promising, uh, particularly with the ability to target uh, based upon your age and your interests. We got a Vic Health Innovation Grant and developed a web-based app for screening for alcohol harm. And we, the app then led you through a frames-based um, brief intervention. And our evaluation of this uh, was really uh, just to look at clinician acceptability. And the clinicians loved it. Unfortunately, 
it wasn't used very often, so it's a sim you know, s similar story. What about uh, what you can do about illicit drugs for screening. Uh, once again, there's a lot of things out there, but I would recommend the ASSIST portal uh, based at the University of Adelaide uh, for screening for the major illicit drugs and offering an intervention. Like everyone at the dinner tonight, I'll advise you to drink in moderation. I also... <laughs> advise uh, the assist light uh, portal uh, because it's, it's quicker for the busy clinician uh, to, to offer assistance. Of course, um, all of these, uh, particularly adolescents and young people that present with drug and alcohol problems, um, really uh, rarely occur in a void. They're really in a soup of psychological issues. And people will be familiar with the HEADS framework. It's sort of, uh, I get a bit annoyed that they keep adding E's and S's. Um, I, just, I just can't remember the last time I really had time to sit down and talk to an adolescent about spirituality in the emergency department. But, you know, I'm sure that'll come. Uh, but I do believe um, that we should be offering brief interventions, but we should also be referring these adolescents on for more detailed assessments to tease out uh, those psychological issues that are accompanying um, the drug and alcohol use. So, just like Kat and Nat yesterday, I suppose I have a call for arms for clinicians. You are powerful witnesses to the major public health challenges which our society face. And by using our stories and our patient stories and our data, we can com provide compelling arguments for change, for policy change, that can lead to better outcomes uh, on a population level. And what about talking to young people? Well, my advice is to use technology to lose your naughty voice and as Dr. Seuss would say, speak in a voice loud and clear. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Diana. There's been lots of activity on um, Twitter and we have some questions, so I'm going to throw to the lovely Amy. Okay, so we've had a flurry of activity in the last five minutes. Um, so there was a few questions about um, how do we... Um, uh, promote um, the responsibility of alcohol in teenagers if the adults, if their parents are normalising the behaviour or encouraging it by making fun of it and making jokes. Um, what do you think is the appropriate age that parents should be encouraging their children to drink? And do you have any experience in the um, laws, uh, sorry, that should be allowing their children to drink? <laughs> Um, and do you have any experience in the laws um, prohibiting adolescents from drinking and whether or not parents have been prosecuted? That was sort of one group of questions and then we'll move on to the next group. <laughs> There's a bit of blurry. Yes, so le look, I think that um, some jurisdictions, such as Tasmania, have had laws for, uh, you know, 100 years mm -hmm. around this, but most jurisdictions really enacted the laws or developed them uh, in the last decade. Hmm. And they are serious about them, and they will prosecute people. Uh, and we should be telling parents of adolescents, uh, and we should be exploring those issues. I'm not suggesting we ring the police uh, and dob <laughs> parents in, but I think it's important for them to realise um, that they have a social responsibility. And I think um, it was funny, actually, because my, my kids go to a school uh, where there's lots of um, very famous um, actors and things, and um, one of them got an invitation to... Um, to an after party for the musical. And so I wasn't going to be, you know, I emailed them, Mr. Eric Banner. Um, <laughs> but we're not mentioning any names, which is good. <laughs> and said, you know, look, I give permission for my son to attend, but not to drink alcohol. Um, can I help in any way? You know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, they, um, they responded saying, you know, thank you very much. We, you know, we really appreciate your response. We note your uh, consent. Um, and um, by the way, 
you win the prize for the only parent that has gone yeah. hands and us. Um, so I think we all have to be proactive um, as, as our teenagers get older and take responsibility, know what's going on. Um, and it's I think very difficult though, because my son's 16, just had his semi-formal, and the principal said, if, you know, if there's any drinking, you'll be expelled. And parents were saying, well, that's just not good enough. They deserve to be able to drink. You know, so, and then you're, you know, my son's like, I know I'm not allowed to drink, but just don't say anything to any other parents. You know, yeah. like, and it's, it's hard, isn't it? I think there's, um, you know, we know, um, especially with the, a large amount of area, you know, new research around the neuro, the, the, um, the cognitive effects of alcohol. I just think that, God, if, if I'd known that when I was at uni and a young yeah. person, I'd be so much more brilliant than I was <laughs> now. I could have been a I doctor. Just, I, right. <laughs> it really frightens me to think of how brilliant I could have been. But, um, <laughs> but So I think um, really, um, ideally, to, um, Young people should not be drinking uh, till age 24, uh, mm -hmm. but I think there's a really strong argument for moving to what largely is the American model at 21. Yeah. Um, I think some people argue, oh, should you be able to go to war uh, and not drink? Um, I would argue that probably the post-traumatic effects of war, we shouldn't be allowing people to go to war until they're 21 mm. either. Uh, rather so than will you be asking for ID tonight? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we've got another um, group of questions quickly. It, it, there, um, there was another group of questions related to how do you introduce those discussions with teenagers when they're intoxicated? Um, and also, is there a role for linking the somatic symptoms and their injuries to their alcohol use in the emergency department? Yes, look, that is a really, really good question. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just undertaken a qualitative study um, with one of my honours students where we wanted to tease out what the teachable moment was and what, what was the best time to mm. explore that. Uh, because we hear this idea of the teachable moment all the time, but when you actually tease down the research, there's very little exploration of what it actually is. Mm. Um, and in this study, we had a number of young people, um, and um, despite being in situations picked up by ambulances, requiring physical restraint, requiring chemical restraint, in the emergency department injuries, they all view these things as just a one-off. And things there, you know, it's, it's under the control. It's mm. not going to happen again. Um, and so there is some evidence from the brief intervention literature that, um, you know, perhaps you should do it when the sutures are being removed or the plasters being mm. put on, on review. Uh, later, but I think the key that I take from my reading of the research is um, with adolescents and young people, you can't have um, long-term worries for them. You, you don't really want to talk about liver disease, you know. Uh, it's more about, uh, you know, falling over and losing your front tooth, you know, yeah. um, or, uh, and that's the same with the tobacco, uh, better to talk about cosmetic effects Cosmetics, than lung cancer. Yeah. Uh, so you need those short-term <laughs> goals. Interestingly enough, uh, I was going to present one paper on the affirmation theme that I used for my talk, because there's some evidence that if you give a, an adolescent or a young person an affirmation to use before they go out, mm. uh, then that can be helpful. So um, just, you know, stay nice uh, and... Um, don't, don't vomit. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to pass someone after a vomit. Yes. <laughs> it's a good affirmation. Can I, <clears throat> can I ask a quick question and a, and a bit of a serious one? I spoke after um, Ruben Strayer at Smack last year and he spoke a lot about sedation when people were intoxicated. And in America, you know, they use hog tying and a whole range of things <coughs> to restrain. You know, when it comes to young people, particularly when they're being aggressive or whatever, what, what should we do? Uh, well, I think that, um, um, you know, I, our paramedics use midazolam, mm. uh, and that really scares me, and I think that's certainly what you shouldn't... Uh, you should not do that. Um, and uh, as Ruben would say, ketamine. Ketamine, yeah. OK. Please. Just really quickly, one of the interesting things, there is massive variability in people's approach 
to behavioural difficulties in, in young people. So uh, in Leicester, it might be because we just have goody two-shoes teenagers <laughs> who don't get into any problems at all. But we have our fair share uh, of junks coming in. And, and I, have, I and my colleagues have rarely ever needed physical or chemical mm. sedation. Yet you go to Liverpool and it's a completely different story. Mm. And, then there, and there is something about either what teenagers are doing or what healthcare professionals yeah. are doing. And some of that scares me in the way that we, we uh, approach this. Yeah, um, I think I completely agree with you. And I just think that um, physical restraints and, mm. and chemical restraints is a, it's an inhumane practice that should, should be um, delegated to the last century. Mm. Um, and particularly the issue with methamphetamines has brought this to an issue across Australia. Mm. Um, because um, most, and, and how do we deal with this? Well, we need government policy and we need structural changes in our emergency departments where we have safe spaces that are suitably designed with the human factors in mind that actually promote uh, good, um, like for example, the behavioural areas in Alice Springs ED are perfect yeah. for those sort of things, but we just don't have them. Yeah. Um, and so when you have that busy emergency department, uh, you're left with few options uh, because you don't physically have the space to deal with the issues. Can we also bring back the word pash? I think that's just <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the English equivalent? Pash kissing, like with Snogging. your tongue? <laughs> Snogging. <laughs> Snogging, yes. Pash On that one. note, <laughs> can you please thank, help me thank not only Amy, our Twitter moderator, but our three amazing speakers of Sarah, Damien and Diana for a great session.